Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen Engelhardt uh, from Princeton University. And today I want to talk to you about our work on online tracking and specifically uh, the insights we gained from our most recent uh, million site measurement. So this is joint work with my advisor, Arvind Narayanan, uh, at Princeton. And so as I'm sure everyone here is familiar with, the web is very much so a mashup, right? Uh, when you're visiting a site, you're not just collecting resources or getting resources from that site, but you're getting it from a bunch of different third parties. Uh, and in this specific example, when I visit CNN and the New York Times, uh, I end up contacting 34 different third party domains and getting content from them. Uh, and so as a user, I have to trust that these third party domains are handling my data correctly. And as a site, as a publisher, I have to trust that these third parties are treating my users the way I want them to, right? Not tracking them with techniques I wouldn't agree with or so on. And so the reason I'm saying trust is because there's really very little transparency into this system. Uh, it's not obvious as a publisher, it's not obvious as a user, really what techniques are being used to track uh, when you just visit a site and, and browse it as you normally would. And so I think uh, the proliferation of tracking that we've been seeing is really because of the absence of transparency. And I think measurement can really help fix that. And I want to show you a quick example uh, of some of our past work and some of the impact we've had uh, just from doing the measurement and releasing the results. So uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to be talking about fingerprinting. Uh, if you're not familiar with browser fingerprinting, the basic idea is instead of tra tracking traditionally where you'd put a cookie on the user and every time that user visits, you'd see the same uh, cookie and the same ID back. Instead, you'll use the properties of the user's browser to attempt to identify them and differentiate them from other users. Uh, so you could think of canvas fingerprinting as just another uh, piece of that, that fingerprint. So in 20, May 2012, uh, there was a paper called Pixel Perfect that discussed canvas fingerprinting. I won't go into details on the technique, uh, but I recommend checking out that paper if you're interested. And in two years following that, uh, the release of that paper, a bunch of companies uh, and trackers on the, on, on the web started uh, identifying users with this technique. And then uh, in 2014, we went and measured it. And we found it on about 5% of the top uh, 100,000 sites. And when we released those measurement results in July, uh, we ended up getting a bunch of press coverage related to it. Uh, and then just two days following the press coverage, the largest two fingerprinters using this technique uh, stopped doing it. So I think uh, we dropped from about 5% of the top 100,000 to something like 0.1%. Um, so the technique was largely no longer used, just in the result of us uh, releasing some measurement data. And I think this is because uh, you know, trackers aren't, aren't malicious actors in the, in the normal sense, right? These are businesses whose business interest does depend on tracking, but it's not like uh, they're trying to serve malicious content to their users. It's not like they're trying to fish anyone. It's not like they're actually trying to kind of hide or fool uh, privacy researchers or privacy tools. Uh, we see the bulk of trackers respond to this kind of pressure from publishers, from users, and certainly from regulatory or, uh, or lawsuits. And, and historically, over the past decade, when this kind of privacy research has been going on, uh, we've seen few instances of trackers attempting to avoid detection. And there's also a high, list, a high risk for malicious actions. And I want to share with you uh, two examples of that. So Safari blocks third-party cookies by default. And uh, in the past, there was a workaround where you could basically do a form submission and, and as a third party, still get a cookie set on the user's browser. Uh, and before this, this uh, bug was fixed, um, Google was found to have a tracking script which did this, and they were subsequently uh, subjected to some lawsuits, and there was a resulting settlement for it. Uh, and in our most recent measurements, we don't see this kind of, although that bug has been patched, there are still other ways to work around third-party cookie blocking through top-level redirects or uh, you know, pop-ups and things like that. Uh, but we don't see anything like that really happening with any large degree. And a second example is um, subverting cookie clearing. So if you're a tracker in a, and you're tracking a user with a certain ID and that uh, you know, the user happens to clear their cookies, you'll lose your profile on them. Right? And in 2009, 2011, there were a couple research uh, papers that showed several companies were subverting that by creating something like called ever cookies or super cookies or zombie cookies. And basically the idea is you would store an identifier in multiple places in the browser, not just in the cookies, 
And back then, some other locations weren't cleared when the user would clear their private data. Uh, and then you could respawn that cookie and continue to track the user with the same profile. Uh, and again, we saw a bunch of lawsuits related to that. And uh, in the most recent measurements, at least for US-based trackers, uh, there are no main trackers that are doing this kind of technique anymore. So again, we saw that being very effective in reducing uh, the use of this tracking technique. And so what we see is automated large-scale measurement uh, can return control to users and publishers. Uh, and for the remainder of this talk, I want to focus on the recent work we're doing uh, in this space. So I'll start out just briefly going over our measurement platform. Uh, back in 2014, when we got into this, this uh, area of research, we looked at a bunch of papers, uh, somewhere a little over 30 papers, and we found a few things. We found that there was a lot of re-engineering, right? Most, of, most privacy researchers want, researchers want access to the same things, right? We want HTTP data, we want to see what JavaScript's doing on the page, and we want to get the content of that page. And we saw a lot of people building platforms to do very similar things. Uh, we were worried about methodological differences between real browsers um, and also between kind of stripped down Phantom JS browsers in a way that, say, advertisements would respond uh, thinking, thinking the stripped down browser is a bot. Uh, so we noticed that we can kind of build upon other uh, current platforms, and, and we ended up building OpenWPM, which I think has made studies like this a lot easier. Uh, so I won't go into the details of the architecture. Um, it's, it's open source on GitHub. We open sourced it basically as soon as we started working on it. Uh, and every new study we do, we add in uh, every, any kind of change to the platform. We'll try to make that public as soon as possible. And I think, uh, I think we've, we have some evidence that this has been uh, at least a, a worthwhile undertaking uh, by the studies that we've seen use it since we released it. So in, in 2014, uh, Obviously, we published some of our own studies, and the ones I've highlighted here in blue are ones that I'm involved in. But I think what's been uh, more validating for us is the fact that since 2015, there were four studies which uh, used our platform, which we had no involvement in. I actually found out about these through like a Google Scholar alert uh, popping up and saying, hey, this OpenWPM is, is uh, in one of these papers. So that was validating that you know, at least the platform is easy enough to use and also uh, useful enough for other researchers to start playing around with it. So now I want to move on to some insights from our most recent measurement. Uh, and I think we found a bunch of interesting things. And unfortunately, I won't have time to go through all of them today. So I recommend you check out the full paper, which I've linked here. And I'll link again at the end of the talk. Uh, but today, I'm just going to focus on three things that I think are pretty interesting uh, and, and pretty fun results. So the first is uh, we found that almost all the top third parties are involved in cookie syncing. Uh, if you're not familiar with cookie syncing, it's the idea that uh, two trackers can share the identifiers they have on a user with each other, basically through HTTP redirects. Um, so they both end up knowing uh, the cookie value for the other third party. And what we found was that 45 of the top 50 third parties are involved in cookie syncing. Uh, and that's, you know, if you took any two of them at random, that's there's an 85% chance they would share an ID and therefore be able to share um, data if they, if they wanted to. And I guess the importance of, of this metric here is uh, if I'm going to show you a bunch of more persistent tracking techniques uh, further into the talk, and, and you can think of if any one of those third parties were using it, they would easily be able to kind of help other trackers as well by syncing cookies and then sharing uh, data. And so we, we also looked at a bunch of HTML5 features, and we wanted to see uh, were trackers using these for tracking. And the first, to, before I go into the, the techniques, I want to just share with you how we're able to instrument that and uh, how much work it is. So we have a Firefox extension where we've written some kind of custom, custom code to do instrumentation here. We have this instrument object method, which essentially overwrites getters and setters for all uh, properties and all methods on any API we're interested in. So here I'm giving an example of the canvas rendering context and the HTML canvas element where we're going to instrument uh, can, uh, the canvas APIs to see if anyone's doing fingerprinting with it. And this is just some, uh, a snippet of sample code of the call someone would need to make if they wanted to uh, do canvas fingerprinting. Uh, 
And then we would see a, a log, so something like this, right? We'd see the script making those calls. We'd see the method names, the property names, as well as any arguments that were provided to them. And then post-measurement, we could go and see, OK, did, the, you know, did this script call the sufficient number of APIs in, in, the, in the same way we'd expect uh, if they were doing fingerprinting? And the nice thing here is we can also check for tampering uh, or, or instrumentation inspection so we could see if scripts are uh, overwriting our getters or overwriting our, our setters and so on. And while going through these fingerprinting scripts, we found interest some interesting uh, properties. So uh, certainly we'll observe a certain sequence of APIs, right? We'll see, oh, OK, this is canvas fingerprinting and so on. Uh, when we found that techniques are clustered together, uh, so when you open up a fingerprinting script, you'll see uh, calls to canvas and calls to property and calls to read the user's fonts and so on. And then we found, of course, that these results are combined in a vector and sent back to the server. And really, we see limited API use beyond that uh, for fingerprinting. And so I want to walk through three uh, HTML5 APIs that we found, uh, at least a couple scripts uh, using to track users online in the wild. Um, so the first is, is the abuse of WebRTC's peer generation for tracking. And here, uh, you can see, I'm not going to go into WebRTC in detail. Uh, there's a great blog post I've linked at the bottom of this slide. Uh, but basically, the idea is uh, WebRTC enables peer-to-peer -peer communication in the browser. Part of peer-to-peer -peer communication is NAT traversal. And part of that is gathering uh, local candidates to do NAT traversal. So WebRTC provides this uh, data channel basically lets you set up a peer-to-peer -peer data channel for, for uh, communication. And uh, two things can happen when you do that. The first is uh, a user's real IP address can be leaked if they're behind a VPN. Um, there's actually a standard in place to fix this, so I want to focus instead uh, on the second point, which is that a user's local IP address uh, from their local interfaces will be leaked. And for a home user, this is probably something like uh, 192.168.2, but uh, it may be more identifying for corporate users or university users uh, who may use uh, you know, something from a different IP space uh, on their, on, be, even though they're still behind a NAT. And so again, we just had to write one line of measurement code to do this measurement. Uh, and we found that when you visit the home page of a site, uh, if it is setting up a data channel and if it's doing it without your interaction, which is what our crawler did, 90% uh, of those cases were for tracking, right? They basically uh, tried to set up the connection, gathered the local candidates, and added them over to a, an overall fingerprinting vector, which was sent back to the server. So on a million sites, we only found this on 625, so it's not a very widely used technique, uh, but we're going to be interested in seeing how it grows uh, as we check our new measurements going forward. Uh, the second thing we saw was the use of the audio API for fingerprinting. Um, so if you're not familiar with that API, the idea is you can do audio processing, signal generation. Uh, you can send that to the speaker. You can save that to disk and so on. And so we found one script doing it uh, where basically they set up a, an oscillator, a triangle wave. They pass that through an analyzer node. And then um, just because of the way it was set up, they had to set the gain equal to 0 and, and put it to a destination, which is, say, the speakers. And here we saw uh, a hash of that FFT, and that was used as the identifier. And then we saw uh, a second configuration where a script was using a sine wave, passing that through a compressor, and sending it to a buffer. And then again, that result, to, that result was hashed. And because we hadn't really seen this before, uh, we wanted to see, is it actually effective? Is it good for tracking a user? Is it identifying? So we set up a test page, uh, which I've linked at the bottom of this. And we actually have some initial results from it so far, just some preliminary analysis. Uh, and what we found was the top technique listed here isn't actually very stable. Um, and if you go into that script, uh, it's actually that code path is disabled. So it seems like they knew that. Uh, basically, for all of our repeat users, we would see uh, a significant number of them have a different fingerprint on their second visit or third visit. But we found the second uh, configuration on the bottom here to actually be pretty stable. So for our repeat visitors, they had the same fingerprint when they came back. Uh, but it wasn't particularly identifying. We saw a lot of collisions between different users. Uh, and actually, when we dug more into the data, we saw that 
It was largely aligned to the user's browser and to the user's uh, operating system. So though that's not really a concern for normal browsers, because you can just query that, say, in the user agent string, uh, it is a concern for the Tor browser, where part of their threat model is to have all of the um, all of their browsers look the same, right? have the same fingerprint. And so we had about 300 samples from Tor browsers, and we found only seven distinct fingerprints between them. Uh, but the Tor browser devs are, are aware of this, and they're working on a fix and investigating really what's causing uh, different OSs to return different values for this fingerprint. So that was nice to see. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to talk about the use of battery status for tracking. So this, this technique was actually uh, introduced in a paper called The Leaking Battery in 2015. So I'll first explain the technique uh, from that paper and then present some of our uh, measurement results for it. So let's say I visit CNN and there's a script on that page that queries my battery status. So they get back something like my current status is 11% and here's the approximate discharge time for that. And let's say uh, while I'm on here, I want to open a new link and I don't want that to be, uh, for some reason I want to open it in a private window. I don't want it to be tracked with the rest of my history. So I'll right click and I'll say open in a new private window. And let's say the same, ex the same script exists on this new window as well, right? So they read my battery status again and get the same values back. And although uh, this doesn't seem very identifying by itself, you can imagine if, say, there are a bunch of users behind a NAT and a corporation, uh, a battery status could be helpful to at least differentiate between those users if you combine it with their IP address. And so we were surprised that we discovered, uh, even just in looking at the scripts for all of the other techniques, we discovered two instances of scripts using battery status and sending that back uh, along with the fingerprint on about 22 sites. So we still haven't done a full measurement of this, but that's uh, something we're planning to do in, in future work. And I think what surprised us so much was that just a year after this paper coming out, we already saw scripts adopting uh, this technique. So I've talked a lot about how browsers can be tracked, uh, but now it comes to the question of, well, what do current browser privacy features or do current uh, privacy tools help protect against these tracking techniques? Uh, and what we find is that they are pretty effective, especially for uh, stateful tracking. So because OpenWPM is built on top of Firefox, we can you know, try Firefox's uh, protection mechanisms, we can install third-party extensions, and so on, and then run a crawl with one of those. So we turned on third-party cookie blocking, blocking both uh, setting and getting of cookies, and we found that it was pretty effective. Uh, we only found a few sites, again, working around this block by kind of re redirecting their top-level domain. And then we found the average number of third-party cookies per site to reduce uh, by about five on average. And I think that's largely from uh, the fact that when there are no third-party cookies, there's no cookie syncing going on. Uh, and then we also did the same crawl with Ghostry, again, on the top 50,000 sites. And we found that the average number of third parties reduced from 18 to just three, uh, with very few third-party cookies being set. And when we dug more into to that blocking data, we noticed something interesting. Uh, if we rank these third parties by their popularity, and, and we define popularity in the paper, but you can just think of it as a uh, third party is more popular if they're either on more popular first parties or if they're on a larger number of first parties. Um, so if we rank, by, rank third parties by popularity, we notice that uh, the more popular third parties were blocked with a higher blocking rate. Uh, and there are probably multiple explanations for why that could be. Two we thought of was, well, maybe third, more popular third parties are more likely to track. Uh, or maybe it's that these tools that are based on crowdsourcing are kind of missing the lower end, missing the less popular third parties. Um, and we have some evidence that that might be the case when we look at uh, fingerprinting scripts where we have ground truth, where we've actually measured, uh, you know, we actually have instrumentation to detect all instances of, of those scripts. And so uh, what I'm going to present here is both uh, results on a technique that we've measured, for example, Canvas, and then show how well EasyList and Easy Privacy, uh, the two main lists that feed into Adblock Plus, uh, block those scripts and instances of those scripts. So when I say percentage of scripts, I mean the percentage of scripts which do the technique. And the percentage of sites is 
the percentage of instances of that fingerprinting technique had you browse the top 50,000 sites. So since some scripts are embedded on a lot more sites than others, blocking those scripts will give you a higher percentage of blocking uh, in terms of sites. And what we see for both Canvas and Canvas font, uh, both of these techniques of which are discussed in the paper but I didn't discuss today in the talk, we see a higher blocking rate for sites than we do for scripts, significantly higher, showing us that the popular scripts are being blocked, um, but the less popular ones are still loading and still fingerprinting. And then when we look at the two new techniques, uh,